Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, today, I'm going to talk about cultivating the empty field. Um, the silent, the subtitle is The Silent Illumination of Zen Master Hong Ji. Uh, Cynthia Toku Scott turned me on to this book. And I don't remember exactly how, but um, I'm grateful to her. It's a very interesting. Um, Zen Master Hong Ji had a uh, a big influence on Dogen Zenji. Um, um, for those of you, he is a 13th century Zen monk in the Soto Zen tradition, born in 1200, died in 1252. And um, we currently are studying on Monday nights his book, um, Bendoa. It's a fantastic class. It's a great book. And after reading some of this, I realized um, Hong Ji's influence on Dogen, which was rather profound. But if you aren't taking this class, it's not too late to sign up. And I really recommend it. It's an excellent class. It's on Monday nights. And I've learned a great deal from it. Really excellent. So um, Hong Ji um, well, let me just talk about the title a little bit. I don't know much about Dan Layton, Tigan Dan Layton, but he does commentary and it's good commentary. Um, but the title, Cultivating the Empty Field, I interpreted that to mean um, Zen practice. It's a reference to Zen practice. So cultivating the empty field is um, just to practice Zazen. It's the practice of Zazen. And the image of the open field I'm sorry, cultivating the empty field, not the open field. The empty field is that really there's nothing to get from Zazen, absolutely nothing. Zazen, as Sawaki Roshi has says, said, is totally useless. And this is true liberation, understanding that Zen practice and enlightenment are not two, they're one and the same, and that there's absolutely nothing to get from Zen practice is um, total liberation. And that's how I interpreted the title, Cultivating the Empty Field. Um, it's empty of any kind of substance and absolutely anything we could possibly get from it. And in practicing, in our Zen practice, um, the field, the empty field cultivates us as well. It's a two-way street. Um, I tried to find the reference, but Mike Wallace in Monday's class, in re when we were reading this, there was a reference to Zazen doing us. And um, I feel like that's what happens in Zazen. Not only do we practice Zazen, but Zazen practices us. Uh, there's no duality, no separation there. And... Um, Anyway, so let me just say a little bit about what Dan Layton says about silent illumination. In his introduction, he says, the silent illumination that Zen master Hong Ji expounds is both a form of sitting meditation practice and an orientation to a spiritual way of life. His writings display the many facets of the universal, universally available experience of non-dual, 
a word I don't like a whole lot, but um, no, no separation, non-dual objectless meditation and the endless refinements and attunements involved in living out this awareness. So not only is it practice, but it's also living out this awareness that we practice in Zazen. Um, silent illumination, Dan Layton says, involves withdrawal from exclusive focus on a particular sensory or mental object to allow intent apprehension of all phenomena as a totality. This objectless meditation aims at a radical, refined non-dualism that does not grasp at any of the highly subtle distinctions to which our familiar mental workings are prone and which estranges us from our experience. Um, boy, that's really complicated. <laughs> boy, I uh, forget that. Anyway, it's just too too many words. Such subject odd. There is this subject odd and object uh, dichotomization that's being transcended when we talk about objectless awareness. Uh, this is also wordless awareness. This is shikantaza. Steve has talked about this, and he talks about it in his class, in his book, uh, Meditation Now or Never. This objectless, subjectless awareness. Um, anyway, Dan Leighton goes on to say, silent illumination is also objectless in the sense of not seeking after specific limited goals, which I talked about. There is no seeking after goals in Zazen. Practice and enlightenment are one. There is no separating them. We can't separate them. Dogen says that over and over and over again. Um, in the Fukan Zazengi, in Bendoa, uh, we just cannot separate practice and enlightenment. They're one. They're not separable. Um, but in order to express this true Buddha nature that is our... Um, our nature, our, who we are, we have to practice in order to express it. We have to practice. Uh, we cannot express it and manifest it unless we practice it. Hang on. So he had, as I said, I think I said, a big influence on Dogen. I'll get to that. Um, he says, Dan Layton says, Hongji tells us that this bright, empty field, which lies imminent, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, in us all, um, in no way can be cultivated or artificially enhanced. Uh, but there is practice. So we must only recognize it and not allow, as he says, our busy mischievous thinking <laughs> and conditioning to interfere with our own radiant clarity. So this clarity also is our true nature, this illumination. And I never really thought about it till I started reading this. But Dogen talks about in um, the Fukan Zazengi, turning your light inward to illuminate yourself and body and mind of themselves will drop away and your original face will be manifest. Um, this, this light that we turn inward to illuminate ourselves, this is the silent illumination, I think, that uh, Hongji is referring to. Um, it's part of our Buddha nature. So Hongji was almost a contemporary of Dogen. He lived from 1091 to 1157, born in China. Um, he, 
he would have been called a different name that I can't pronounce. There's the Zheng Jui, um, which means correct or true awakening. It was his monk ordination name. Light Dogen, it sounds like he was um, a bit of a child prodigy. Uh, he had memorized several thousand Chinese characters before he was seven years old. Um, he left home at the age of 11 to become a monk. And at 18, he went to Ruzhao in modern Honan province to study with the Soto Zen master, Kumu Fakeng. This is interesting. I don't really care we studied with, but Kumu, um, his style of practice involved sitting meditation that was so still that his body was said to resemble a block of dry wood. Hence, his name means dry wood, complete dharma. And I don't know if those of you who sit Sazen, really sitting still does help. It helps a lot. It helps practice just to sit still. Um, and so this, I love his name, dry wood, complete dharma. And Hongji, according to Dan Layton, emulated this practice of a mobile sitting throughout his career. Such cross-legged sitting position, and I'm sorry, such cross-legged posture, sitting in lotus posture, um, was the unstated physical context for all of Hongji's meditation instructions. He did travel to other temples. Um, interestingly, um, at Incense Mountain Temple, he overheard a monk reciting a line from the Flower Ornament Sutra. I just, I'm teaching the Flower Ornament Sutra on Tuesdays, and who knows where this one line came from. It's a sutra of over half a million words. Who knows how many Chinese characters. But anyway, the one line from the Flower Ornament Sutra that awoke Hongji was, the eyes which our parents give us can behold 3,000 worlds. Upon hearing this, he experienced an awakening. This is, I'm gonna recount this dialogue to you because it's very interesting. When he told Master Shang Shan, who was apparently the abbot of the Incense Mountain Temple, of his experience, Zhang Shan pointed to a box of incense and asked, what is inside? And Hong Ji said, what does mind do? Mind with a capital N. And Hong, Zhang Shan asked, where does your enlightenment come from? And Hong Ji drew a circle in the air with his hand and threw it behind him. And Zhang Shan said, you are a man who produces muddiness. And then he asks, what is your capacity? And Hong Ji said, mistake. And Zhang Shan said, don't see people as others. And Hong Ji answered, yes, yes. Um, and supposedly later, Dogen, influenced by this, um, was asked, um, was uh, commented on his own life that it was one continuous mistake, uh, which is very interesting. Anyway, um, I want to read you. Well, let me just say about Ben Doa, I discovered this by accident. Um, 16. 
I just happened to run across this. In, um, in Uchiyama Roshi's comments on Bendoa, on page 162, he says, in our Zazen, we don't view our thought on the basis of thought, but put it in the ground of life and see thoughts as mere secretions from our brain. We see the function of secretions as one of the abilities of our life force. We see this by letting go of thought. And then he says, therefore, our practice is called silent illumination. In this way, our life settles into our life. This is Zazen. So I have a feeling that um, I hadn't expected to run across that. Um, we see this by letting go of thought. Therefore, our practice is called silent illumination. But that was very interesting. Uh, to get back to Hongji. Um, it says uh, Dogen went to China and received transmission of Soto teachings from Ru Jing. Anyway, he says Hongji's influence on Dogen can be seen most clearly in their meditation practice and in their understanding of its meaning. Dogen called the silent illumination meditation taught by Hongji as shikantaza, or just sitting, an expression for silent illumination, illumination used by Rujing. Objectless, non-dualistic, this meditation does not involve stri stages or striving, striving for any goal or achievement. I already said this. Um, but what I wanted to do was Interestingly, Hongji wrote a poem called Acupuncture Needle of Zazen, which I may or may not read. I don't know if I'm going to get to it, but I find that title really intriguing. Dogen later wrote a poem also entitled Acupuncture Needle of Zazen, and I don't have Jose's genius for looking these things up, um, but... Uh, I'm sure it's out there somewhere, Dogen's version. Dogen was not trying in any way to correct what Hong Ji said in his poem, Acupuncture Needle of Zazen. He said that Hong Ji said it right. He just wanted to say it a little differently. Um, according to Don, Dan Layton, Dogen's needle poem amplifies Hong Ji's illumination without encountering objects. That's in the poem. And I'll wait maybe to um, get to that. In order to emphasize that wholeness is itself, completeness is itself, realization, and is enacted by effort without desire, without desire to get anything. Um, anyway, I'm going to read you Um, one of these practice instructions. This is called um, the ground that sages cannot transmit. This is Hongji. Cast off completely your head and skin. Thoroughly withdraw from distinctions of light and shadow. Where the 10,000 changes do not reach, 
is the foundation that even a thousand sages cannot transmit. Simply by yourself, illuminate and deeply experience it with intimate accord. The original light flashes through confusion. True illumination reflects into the distance. Deliberations about being and non-being are entirely abandoned. The wonder appears before you. Its benefit transferred out for kalpas. Immediately you follow conditions and accord with awakening without obstruction from any defilements. The mind is not attached to things and your footsteps are not visible on the road. Then you are called to continue the family business. Even if you thoroughly understand, still, please practice until it is familiar. So um, the family business is in a footnote, and I hope I can find it. <laughs> Ah, here it is, page 92. I have the footnotes written down. David doesn't have to worry. Um, the family business is an image for the perpetuation and transmittal of a particular teaching, tradition, or lineage. In a broader sense, all those who take refuge in Buddha Dharma are called children of Buddha. So to carry on the family business means to fulfill one's own innermost heartfelt vow uh, to achieve enlightenment in the Mahayana by liberating all beings together with oneself. So this is not enlightenment for oneself only. This is enlightenment so one can enable all beings to wake up. Uh, this is the Bodhisattva vow, by the way, to save all sentient beings, though they are numberless. Um, I love this expression, cast off completely your head and skin. Um, so thoroughly withdraw from dimensions of light and shadow, any kind of distinctions. Just step back from those. Um, simply by yourself, illuminate and deeply experience it with intimate accord. So this according with reality, according with truth in practice. Uh, this is very intimate. Um, this is... This is illumination, this is deep experience. The original light flashes through confusion. So whatever confusion we may have about light and dark, about good and evil, about whatever dichotomy you wanna talk about, that illumination flashes through it when we just sit and drop off body and mind, which means just letting go which is talked about over and over again in Bendoa, just letting go, just um, not holding on to ideas, opinions, judgments, just letting them go. That's how the original light um, flashes through confusion. This is not to say confusion is bad. This is not to say Delusion is bad. This is not to say enlightenment is good. We're just abandoning all these dichotomies because they're painful. They're a source of pain and confusion. And we get caught up in them. And then part of this silent illumination is acting out of awareness with compassion. And when we're confused in that way, it's difficult to act out of this awareness with compassion. Any questions or comments so far? Yes. Uh, the book that you were reading from 
Uh, I just want to ask a little about you just keep practicing until it is familiar. Oh, it is familiar. It's home. It's our home. We know this, those of us who practice on a regular basis. It is like coming home. It's what we actually do know. This is, as Steve has said many times, all we can know. This is wisdom. All we really can know is this wisdom. And it's familiar. It's home. And that's what we discover in practice. I really like that. Still, please practice until it is familiar. Then there's another um, practice instruction after that entitled, With Total Trust, Roam and Play in Samadhi. Uh, samadhi is objectless awareness. Uh, um, it's deeply practiced practicing, penetrating practice, just sitting. Um, so empty and desireless, cold and thin, simple and genuine. This is how to strike down and fold up the remaining habits of many lives. Don't be disturbed by the many lives. Um, uh, don't worry about that. Empty and desireless, cold and thin, simple and genuine. This is how to strike down and fold up the remaining habits of many lives. When the stains from old habits are exhausted, the original light appears, blazing through your skull, not admitting any other matters. Vast and spacious, like sky and water merging during autumn, like snow and moon having the same color. This field is without boundary. This is the empty field, by the way. This field is without boundary, beyond direction, magnificently one entity, without edge or seam. This is totality, wholeness. Further, when you turn within and drop off everything completely, realization occurs right, right at that moment, right at the time of entirely dropping off deliberation and discussion, arguing, debating, holding opinions, views, arguing with others are 1,000 or 10,000 miles away. Still, no principle is discernible. So what could be there to point to or explain? People with the bottom of the bucket fallen out immediately find total trust. So we are told simply to realize mutual response and explore mutual response. This is the call and response of the world. I see this as the cries of the world to which the bodhisattva of compassion responds. Anyway, so we are told simply to realize mutual response and explore mutual response, then turn around and enter the world. Um, roam and play in samadhi. We've heard about this from Dogen who talks about to sporting oneself freely in the Dharma. Every detail clearly appears before you. Sound and form, echo and shadow happen instantly without leaving traces. The outside, the outside and myself do not dominate each other. There's no struggle between inside and outside between what we, between other and me, or other and I, there's no struggle there. There's no dichotomy. 
I love the way he puts it. The outside and myself do not dominate each other, only because no perceiving of objects comes between us. And I think he means um, this, this conceiving, our tendency to conceptualize, to make objects out of what is a seamless totality, a seamless wholeness, which confuses us, causes us pain and suffering. He says, sound and form, echo and shadow, which sound like um, something but it, that is outside of us, but isn't really, happen instantly without leaving traces. Uh, the outside and myself do not dominate each other, only because no conception, no perceiving of objects uh, comes between us. Only this non-perceiving, non-conceptualization, non-dual awareness encloses the empty space of the Dharma realm's majestic 10,000 forms. People with the original face should enact, should enact and fully investigate the field without neglecting a single fragment. So this expression, people with the bottom of the bucket fallen out. Um, this is a Zen image. The bottom of the bucket falling out is a Zen image for the experience of one's preconceptions and fixed world view, suddenly and completely evaporating. This is practice and realization as one, practice and enlightenment as one, no separation. Practice is enlightenment. After such experience, one's attitudes are transformed irrevocably. Although ingrained habitual responses may still govern one's conduct to varying extents in the context of further activity in the world. Um, probably nobody's perfect. Um, as Dogen said, one continuous mistake. And then samadhi, the state of meditative concentration. And then the Dharma realm, a realm of reality. Um, in Sanskrit, the Dharma Dhatu, which I've talked about in my class on the Flower Garland Sutra, is the whole field of Dharma or truth, equivalent to all dharmas or entities. That is the entire phenomenal universe seen in its primordial purity. Any questions or comments? I thought I might read just this first sentence of this uh, one reading, simply drop off everything. Silently dwell in the self. And in Bendoa, there's a lot of discussion about the self, what the true nature of the self is. Silently dwell in the self in true suchness, abandon conditioning. This is conditioning based on uh, what sort of family we were born into, what sort of life experiences we've had. Um, um, I don't know. I'm a white woman. Um, that implies a lot of things. I have a college education, that implies a lot of other things. I've had opportunities. Um, so I think there's a certain amount of conditioning that comes along with our life experiences, either chosen or not. We don't choose what sort of family we're born into. I was born the oldest of four kids. I did a lot of, um, I was a parentified child, as they say. Um, but anyway, that's what they mean by conditioning. We all have that kind of conditioning, regardless. And in this silent dwelling, uh, we can abandon that conditioning. 
We can just let go of it. We don't have to hold on to it. It doesn't have to cause us any pain or suffering. It says, open-minded and bright, without de defilement, simply penetrate and drop off everything. Just as, Do as um, Dogen says in Vendoa, just let it go. Just drop off body and mind. Um, and then it says here, today is not your first arrival here. Although you are inherent, inherently spirited and splendid, I love that. Um, this is our true nature. Inherently spirited and splendid. Still, you must go ahead and enact it. When doing so, immediately display every atom without hiding a speck of dirt. Dry and cool in deep repose. Um, profoundly understand. If your rest is not satisfying and you yearn to go beyond birth and death, beyond conditioning, beyond our circumstances, he says, there can be no such place. Just burst through and you will discern without thought dusts, pure without reasons for anxiety. Stepping back with open hands, and in uh, brackets it says, giving up everything, giving up ideas, letting go, um, is thoroughly comprehending life and death. Immediately you can sparkle and respond to the world. Accordingly, we are told that from ancient to modern times, all dharmas are not concealed, always apparent, always exposed. There's nothing hidden. There is no mystery, as Steve has said. Nothing's hidden. It's available to us. We just have to pay attention, drop off our ideas, our preconceived notions about what's going on. There is this poem um, about um, the acupuncture needle of Zazen, but it's 1040. Um, I can read it. I'll read it. It's, very, it's actually very interesting. Um, the acupuncture needle of Zazen. Remember, Hong Ji is talking about upright sitting, uh, the Zazen posture. Um, the essential function of all Buddhas, the functional, and, the functional essence of all ancestors is to know without touching things and illuminate without encountering objects. This knowing without, in touch, without touching things. Um, boy, that's a tough one. We don't have to conceptualize about anything. The knowledge that we have, the awareness that we have, is sufficient. We don't have to try to contact anything or make contact anything by trying to find out something about it, whatever that may be. I suspect that's what's meant here by knowing without touching things. Touching things being conceptual knowledge and knowing without that is um, this objectless awareness, this uh, inherent knowledge that is our Buddha nature. And it's also to illuminate without encountering objects, um, without setting up any kind of dichotomy between subject and object, 
We don't have to do that. Knowing without touching things, this knowledge is innately subtle. Illuminating without encountering objects, this illumination is innately miraculous. The knowledge innately subtle has never engaged in discriminative thinking. So this uh, knowledge without um, touching things is knowledge that is, it's not discriminative thinking. The illumination innately miraculous has never displayed the slightest identification. I like that word identification because we assume we can know something by projecting our own qualities about ourselves um, out onto something else. Oh yeah, I know, I know what they're talking about. I've had that experience. You know, we tend to project our own experiences onto others, onto whatever, without really understanding that um, that's a false sort of identification, a false sort of illumination. Um, so this illumination innately miraculous has never displayed the slightest identification. Never engaging in discriminative thinking, this knowledge is rare without match. Never displaying the most minute identification, this illumination is complete without grasping. We don't need to grasp. There's nothing to grasp. Um, the water is clear right down to the bottom. Fish lazily swim on. The sky is vast without end. Birds fly far into the distance. Hongji draws a lot on nature. He loves images from nature, but that's his acupuncture needle of Zazen. Uh, and apparently Dogen's written his own version, uh, but I don't have that. Um, another time. So that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Any questions or comments? No, huh? Yes. Um, I always get kind of um, hot when you, when any speaker talks about um, conceptualization and, you know, framing up the world and separate things as that's what causes us pain and suffering. Because my understanding, um, is that, you know, thinking everything is one and there's no separation can also cause us suffering if we're investing in either of those views, like it's not one, it's not two. And it's not even a toggling back and forth between those things. Right, exactly, Although, exactly. You know, one of those things, I mean, it just sounds so dualistic. I mean, th there's only two. <laughs> Well, you know, there might be more than two, but um, but one appears more strongly to us than the other one, and we really don't begin to have some understanding of the oneness and the non-separation of things until we, you know, become familiar with a sitting practice. True. Right. Um, True. <clears throat> But, you know, maybe I'm going back to the Four Noble Truths or whatever, you know, the, well, there's suffering in life. And, you know, are we supposed to like be, I don't know, um, thinking about wholeness, you know, generating or living in a way that honors wholeness. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say here exactly, but. Um, we've touched on some really excellent points. In a sense, you've answered your own question. We don't want to get caught by either extreme, not 
dwelling in emptiness. We don't want to dwell in emptiness. Uh, as it says in the Xin Ching Ming, be serene in the oneness of things. Um, so we're not saying that this um, objectification, this reaching out and touching objects is bad. That's not what we're saying. We have to conceptualize in order, you know, as Steve says, we have to go to the supermarket and make discriminations among rotten tomatoes and good tomatoes or um, a ripe pineapple from a green pineapple. You know, we have to make discriminations and distinctions in order to get through everyday life. It's when we reify them, when we think that's really all that's going on and that our preferences, which come out of making these sorts of choices. Um, when these preferences guide our actions, that's what's meant by um, intentionality. When we act out of intention, act out of preferences, act out of desires. Um, and that's not bad either, but it's just, you know, we're not, we're just talking about not holding on to anything. Right, not not necessarily, um, you know, thinking that we can avoid all these things. Exactly. Ever, but just seeing what is going on in the moment and dropping it and just keeping going. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, sometimes yeah. when we say the word grasp, it seems like semantics in a way because we can use the word understand, but we can't use the word grasp. I mean, I think grasping is like you're really super invested in something that you think. Well, we, we get super invested in things. Right, we do. We do grasp. Yeah. Um, and there's just noticing that. Yeah. That's what, as Bose talked about, watching your mind. It's just watching your mind. Um, uh, it's, and it's a practice. It's um, ongoing. But in some, yeah, exactly. In some ways, you answered your own question. Yeah, you had yeah. actually good understanding of what you were asking about. A comment question. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, what? Well, since you mentioned that I've used that example of going to the grocery store, yeah. grocery store it wasn't so much to distinguish uh, healthy tomatoes from rotten tomatoes. Uh, it, it's even just to- uh, Tomatoes from pineapple. Yeah, or parsley or something else. Right, exactly, so, yes. So, yeah, so the discrimination. Yes. But the other thing that you added that I don't think I've ever inserted it- Oh, sorry. Is, is the value. Like uh, that, rotten tomatoes are bad. And right, can't. right. You haven't. Yeah. So it's no. simply right. simple discrimination. Yes. You're not going to yes. find tomatoes if you can't find tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm sorry. You're right. That's right. You hadn't added that value judgment. Yeah. That's right. That, and that's an important thing. Yeah. So, so you're of... you're saying we can make these sorts of discriminations without value judgments. Yeah. Yes. 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 You're right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. None of this discrimination is bad, as Steve was saying. We have to do this to live. We just have to be aware of what we're doing. Just have to be aware of what we're doing. And that kind of concentrated awareness um, is what Zazen practice is about. Would you agree with that? Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes, Kristen? So 
Um, everything that you said today just resonated so much. There was a lot of richness. I loved the fact that, that there was connectivity between what you said today, as well as what Steve said last week on uh, emptiness. But I also love today how you really touched upon humanity, you know, like the, the rawness, the crudeness, the, uh, you know, the <laughs> aspect of humanity that is just um, so not perfect, right? I mean, you spoke about, you know, we're splendid. And I think, um, yes, we are, but we're splendid, not because we are perfect, but because we're not. And I love the fact how you talked about how um, one continuous mistake, I think that's so beautiful. And I think most of us can't accept that, right? Because we we don't want to be one continuous mistake. We want to be that 100% perfect, you know, Zen practitioner and all this. And I, I just love today how you acknowledged, you know, what we're aspiring to, but also what we are. And that's humans that are raw and flawed. And <laughs> when we can share that and be vulnerable, I think that's when we can really, you know, aspire to be, you know, what we really want to be. So um, anyway, that's what I'm thinking about, among a zillion other things. Really great. Awesome. Well, Thank you. But it was Dogen who said one continuous mistake. I can't take credit for that. No, but um, you can take credit for the joy and the passion that you brought today that okay. inspired, you know, at least me in this room. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you.